This is Kent Blackhurst, and welcome to part 10 of Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming. In this segment, we'll cover from the millennium and beyond. The standard works are the main resources to understanding the mysteries, and we can't expect to come to deeper gospel knowledge just by attending Sunday school or by listening to an inspired talk. True knowledge only comes after taking a question or concern or a gospel topic in which we wish to gain greater understanding and pondering over how truth fits together in one coherent tapestry. Praying specifically to discover truth as we read and study both allow the Holy Ghost to fill in the gaps in reaching greater light and knowledge until our entire soul is filled with light. I invite all who are listening to my video series to prayerfully consider the things that I speak about. I don't have all the answers, but perhaps the Holy Ghost can fill in the blanks that I leave out. So it's in this light that I present my thoughts on the millennium, and in which I hope you'll judge anything that I've covered in my past videos or in this video. If you feel I've misspoken, I hope that you won't say that I just don't believe that will happen that way, but rather go the extra mile and take the scriptures that I've referenced and compare them with other scriptures on the topic and see if it could be the way that I've described or if it could be another way. This is how Joseph Smith and subsequent prophets have encouraged us to grow in the principle of revelation. In Christianity, no earthly epoch has been more sought after than the millennium in which Christ will reign King of Kings. He will have the perfect theocratic government in place for a righteous citizenry. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. Will all be converted at this point? Not at the beginning. Although people will all need to be living according to a certain amount of light, that doesn't mean that they've accepted the ordinances and covenants of Christ's gospel yet. Up to this point, all major religions have taught truths in order to help their members live by terrestrial standards. True, they may not understand the pivotal role Jesus Christ plays for their salvation yet, but they do teach principles to abide by a terrestrial standard of loving and forgiving. And although many will have readily accepted the gospel before Christ's final coming, others will still adhere to their former traditions. So whether they've been Christians in its many varieties, or Buddhists, Hindus, or followers of Islam, if they've lived up to terrestrial norms, they'll still be worthy to abide the Lord's final coming, wherein the millennium begins. Yet, because God will force no person to do something that they don't want to do, he gives them time to choose. The state of those who will be burned are considered wicked because they continue living celestial lives even after witnessing God's judgments upon the earth. Of these Christ said in Matthew 24, 40-41, Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Thus, there will be little outward distinction about who is raised and who is consumed. People of all walks of life will have one person worthy to be raised up while another peer stays for their just retribution. Indeed, Christ's final coming will be great for those honorable people living in at least the terrestrial state and terrible for those living in a telestial or a natural state. Those abiding by their carnal natures are consumable, thus wicked under the definition of Christ. Such only look after their self-interests, and thus they lie, cheat, and steal in order to obtain the desires of their hearts. They are motivated purely by gratifying their physical appetites. Those who are not consumed will be living in an incorruptible state and not be burned at Christ's presence. These are they who work on mastering their physical appetites to match what they already know spiritually. These are those who learn to love all in every situation. These are those who are able to offer forgiveness to others who have trespassed against them. Concerning those who will abide the Lord's final coming, this is what section 4557 of the Doctrine and Covenants says. They that are wise 
and have received the truth, and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide, and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. Comforting words. Those who accept the challenge to live in Zion will be as the Nephites after Christ came to visit them. This is described in 4th Nephi, and it came to pass, the people were all converted unto the Lord upon the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites. And there were no contentions and disputations among them. And every man did deal justly one with another, and they had all things in common among them. Therefore there were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift." Unquote. So, just as it was among those who enjoyed the presence of the Messiah in the Americas, poverty will be eliminated as Zion is established. After this point, a new definition of wickedness will come to light. After the beginning of the millennium, the wicked will refer to those who have still rejected the ordinances of the gospel. In the Doctrines of Salvation, Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, The gospel will be taught far more intensely and with greater power during the millennium until all the inhabitants of the earth shall embrace it. Satan shall be bound so that he cannot tempt any man. Should any man refuse to repent and accept the gospel under those conditions, then he would be accursed. Through the revelations given to the prophets, we learn that during the reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years, eventually all people will embrace the truth. Isaiah prophesied of the millennium as follows in Isaiah 11:6: The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is one of Isaiah's prophecies that Moroni quoted to the prophet Joseph Smith, explaining that it was about to be fulfilled. If the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters do the sea, then it must be universally received. Moreover, the promise of the Lord through Jeremiah is that it will no longer be necessary for anyone to teach his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. That's in the Doctrines of Salvation, volume 3, page 64. Let's see what else the scriptures add about the Millennial Day. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 101, starting in verse 23, it says, And prepare for the revelation which is to come, when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle, which hideth the earth shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together. And every corruptible thing, both of man, or of beasts of the field, or of the fowls of the heavens, or of the fish of the sea that dwells upon the face of the earth, shall be consumed. And also that of element shall melt with fervent heat, and all things shall become new, that my knowledge and glory may dwell upon the earth. And in that day, the enmity of man, and the enmity of beasts, and the enmity of all flesh shall cease from before my face. And in that day, whatsoever any man shall ask, it shall be given to him. And in that day, Satan shall not have power to tempt any man. And there shall be no sorrow, because there is no death. In that day, an infant shall not die until he is old, and his life shall be as the age of a tree, and when he dies he shall not sleep, that is to say in the earth, but shall be changed in a twinkling of an eye, and shall be caught up, and his rest shall be glorious. Yea, verily I say unto you, in that day when the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things, things which have passed, and hidden things which no man knew, 
things of the earth by which it was made, and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above and things that are beneath, things that are in the earth and upon the earth and in heaven, and all they who suffer persecution for my name and endure in faith, though they are called to lay down their lives for my sake, yet shall they partake of all this glory. Wherefore, fear not, even unto death, for in this world your joy is not full, but in me your joy is full. So, as I have contemplated the millennial period, I produced the following list of seven categories of blessings that the world achieves as a result. There are first, governmental blessings, second, educational blessings, third, vocational blessings, fourth, physical blessings, fifth, religious and temple blessings, sixth, blessings of living in a righteous society, and seventh, blessings associated with the end of evil for a thousand years. Governmental blessings. There will only be one nation with one king who will be Jesus Christ. The law of governance will be modeled after the kingdom of God currently upon the earth. The law of consecration will be the economic law, and there will be no poor because earth's inhabitants will be living upon one landmass. The Adamic language will be learned so that all mankind will be able to reason together with greater understanding as people in unity of faith with fused hearts and minds. The two centers of governance will be Zion for the government and Jerusalem for the word of the Lord. Charity will abound as love will be a key motivating factor for our decisions. Self-interests shall willingly align with public good and well-being. Decisions will be made in terms of what is best for every party involved. Thus, decisions won't be made based upon bureaucratic statutes, but rather through the gifts of the Holy Ghost. There will be no need for laws requiring equal treatment, because everyone will be esteemed equally and treated correspondingly. Thus, there will be no racial bias or bigotry. We will see each other as equals and fellow citizens in the kingdom of God, where each person will be uniformly valued as a member of God's family. John the Revelator spoke of this time when he said in Revelation 19.15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, as members of the church, we understand the phrase, a rod of iron. We know that the iron rod is the word of God. And this means he'll reign using the standards and principles of the gospel that he brought to earth. To those who don't understand the symbology of the scriptures, they'll read this and think it's describing a despot who will be ruling with an iron fist, not allowing for liberty. In fact, the opposite is true. The Savior, who trod the winepress alone, will reign with mercy so that we might become purified through Christ's atonement of grace using his divine ability to help us overcome the world and to elevate us to righteous beings with opportunities to progress to a greater state than we ever thought imaginable. Educational Blessings Christ will reveal things that had never been revealed before because we will live 100% in the truth without the distortions, biases, falsehoods, nor by unworkable precepts of men. Thus, we'll be freed from those hindrances that have plagued the world for millennia. New sciences will be discovered. The mysteries of creation will be understood. Comprehension of quantum mechanics astrophysics, chemistry, earth sciences, biology, psychology, and other sciences will put our current knowledge to shame. We'll all have equal access to exceptional educational opportunities 
founded on immutable laws and eternal truths and not men's best guessed theories. Joseph Smith reminded us of this coming day while in the Liberty Jail as he penned the letter to the church. In section 121 he wrote, God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit, yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost that has not been revealed since the world was until now which our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation to be revealed in the last times, which their minds were pointed to by the angels as held in reserve for the fullness of their glory, a time to come in, the which nothing shall be withheld, whether there be one God or many gods, they shall be manifest. All thrones and dominions, principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also, if there be bounds set to the heavens, or to the seas, or to the dry land, or to the sun, moon, or stars, all the times of their revolutions, all the appointed days, months, and years, and all the days of their days, months, and years, and all their glories, laws, and set times shall be revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of times, according to that which was ordained in the midst of the counsel of the eternal God of all other gods before this world was, that should be reserved unto the finishing and the end thereof, when every man shall enter into his eternal presence and into his immortal rest. This also complements Doctrine and Covenants 101, 32 through 34, where it says, Yea, and verily I say unto you, in that day when the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things, things which have passed, and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth by which it was made, and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above and things that are beneath, things that are in the earth and upon the earth and in heaven. Vocational Blessings People will concentrate on vocations that align with their talents and interests to benefit all. Thus, no class or caste system will exist as each vocation will be recognized as being important to the whole of society. Scarcity will not be known as abundance will be a fruit of this era. There will be no difficult bosses using unrighteous dominion based on their job title. Since all people will be living in the same economic strata, there will be no reason to take shortcuts in business or to be dishonest in order to get more stuff than what your neighbor has. All will work for the benefit of their families and society equally. The economy of the terrestrial kingdom will not be like any economy on the earth today. We won't be living under a system of capitalism, communism, socialism, or fascism, or anyism. Isaiah revealed what he saw of the millennial day. In Isaiah 65, verses 21 through 24, he said, And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them, and they shall not build, and another inhabit, they shall not plant, and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Thus, we will be blessed by all the fruits of our labors. The desires of our hearts will be answered by a system that will allow for us to achieve all that we desire in righteousness. In the Doctrine and Covenants section 101, 27, the Lord said, And in that day, whatsoever any man shall ask, it shall be given unto him. This state of living will greatly contrast the world in which we live today. Physical blessings. We will be living in a translated state, partaking of every blessing such a body offers. Wounds will quickly heal. Mental and physical illnesses like cancers, heart disease, 
and flus will be unheard of. Those who died before the age of accountability will have the opportunity to be raised during this millennial period so that they might be raised in a body at the time of global righteousness. There will be no death, but rather in a twinkling of an eye will be resurrected to a celestial state if so merited when our lifespan comes to an end. Because of the juxtaposition of living in this celestial sphere in which we live now, we will recognize the paradisiacal state in that this time our experiences were crucial stepping stones to progress to a higher level just as Heavenly Father promised before we were born. Those of us who have lived in this pre-millennial period and survived to see the millennial state will appreciate the contrast even more. We were reserved to live at this time period to be a light amongst so much darkness. Now is the time to learn service to help our brothers and sisters understand their true relationship to God. This is a time of refinement. This mortal state offers us a chance to accelerate our learning and to be prepared to live a terrestrial and then a celestial law. Yet our terrestrial state will be so much more glorious and magnificent that we'll fall upon our knees and wet the Savior's feet with our tears of gratitude for his plan to get us there. We'll see how we've grown from grace to grace thanks to his gospel plan that we followed. We also know that the keys of translation will be given even before the millennium officially starts. I know that in at least my Sunday school classes, we really haven't talked much about the exact timing of when the righteous will be raised up to meet the Savior in the clouds of heaven. And so there are many opinions. First, many mistakenly believe that this will take place once he parts the Mount of Olives and when all the world shall see him come in glory. This actually takes place at Adam on Diamon and at Christ's ultimate coming to the entire world. To show you how we arrive at this conclusion, let's read from some modern day scriptures. First, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, verse 44 through 46. It says, and then they shall look for me, and behold, I will come, and they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. And he that watches not for me shall be cut off, but before the arm of the Lord shall fall, and angels shall sound his trump, and the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. Wherefore, if ye have slept in peace, Blessed are you, for as you now behold me and know that I am, even so shall ye come unto me, and your souls shall live, and your redemption shall be perfected, and the saints shall come forth from the four corners of the earth. Now pay special attention to this next verse. Then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon the nations. The Lord spoke plainly. The order is that the dead shall rise, the members of the church from all the earth who haven't been cut off due to disobedience shall meet the Savior in the cloud, and then and only after that will the arm of the Lord fall upon all nations, referring to the great earthquake. Before the arm of the Lord is revealed, which has the connotation of showing military strength to defeat his enemies, he'll cut off from among his people those disobedient who neither hear his voice nor the voice of his servants. Translated beings have particular missions to minister to those who remain on the earth to help prepare for Christ's final coming so that they won't be among those who are burned at the time of the Lord's concluding arrival. This shouldn't be confused with the idea of the rapture. Many of our evangelical Christian brothers and sisters talk about the concept of the rapture as preceding the seven year period of tribulation where all the righteous Christians will be raised at that point so that they don't have to suffer the period of God's wrath upon the wicked. However, I believe this is just a misunderstanding of the scriptures. 
for neither Catholics nor other traditional Protestants like Lutherans, Presbyterians, nor Methodists believe that as it isn't scripturally based, at least not without taking some cognitive leaps or using creative license. Now, my intent is not to offend any who believe this, as it truly would be appealing and even hopeful. Yet, while the rapture isn't specified as such in the scriptures, being taken up is. And as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, we've been blessed with some additional insights to help put everything into better context. So to recap what translation means, let's go over the definition in the Guide to the Scriptures where it states that they are persons who are changed so that they do not experience pain or death until their resurrection into immortality. Let's see what insight Joseph Smith gave regarding translated beings. Quote, now the doctrine of translation is a power which belongs to this priesthood. There are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have been kept from before the foundation of the world. They are hid from the wise and the prudent to be revealed at the last times. Then, in Doctrine and Covenants 135, we read that there are no angels who minister to this earth, but those who do belong or have belonged to it. Thus, we understand from this that the keys of translation will be revealed before the second coming. And as President Nelson said at the time in which we're living, we're witnesses to a, a process of restoration. If you think the church has been fully restored, uh, you're just seeing the beginning. There's much more to come. Wait till next year. <laughs> and then the next year. <laughs> Eat your vitamin pills. Get your rest. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. I imagine that this will be another facet of the restoration that will be introduced to the priesthood of which President Nelson alluded to when he made that statement. The prophet Joseph Smith further declared, Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and into an eternal fullness. But this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order, and a place prepared for such characters he, God, held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets, and who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead." Unquote. He further stated, quote, Translated bodies are designed for future missions. That's in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 191. For example, in 3rd Nephi 28, 27-30, it says, speaking of the three translated Nephites who administer until Christ's second coming, And behold, they will be among the Gentiles, and the Gentiles shall know them not. They will also be among the Jews, and the Jews shall know them not. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord seeth fit in his wisdom, that they shall minister unto all the scattered tribes of Israel, and unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, and shall bring out of them unto Jesus many souls, that their desire may be fulfilled, and also because of the convincing power of God which is in them. And they are as the angels of God. And if they shall pray unto the Father in the name of Jesus, they can show themselves unto whatsoever man it seemeth them good. Of all the scriptures regarding the gift of being translated, Mormon described many of the powers that the three Nephites possessed. This helps us to learn more about these attributes. He wrote, starting in 3 Nephi 28, verse 13, And behold, the heavens were opened, and they were caught up unto heaven, and saw and heard unspeakable things. And it was forbidden them that they should utter, neither was it given unto them power that they could utter the things which they saw and heard. And whether they were in the body or out of the body, they could not tell. For it did seem unto them like a transfiguration of them, that they were changed from this body of flesh 
into an immortal state that they could behold the things of God. But it came to pass that they did again minister upon the face of the earth. Nevertheless, they did not minister the things which they had heard and seen because of the commandment which was given them in heaven. And now, whether they were mortal or immortal from the day of their transfiguration, I know not. But this much I know, according to the record which hath been given, they did go forth upon the face of the land, and did minister unto all the people, uniting as many unto the church as would believe in their preaching, baptizing them, and as many as were baptized did receive the Holy Ghost. And they were cast into prison by them who did not belong to the church, and the prisons could not hold them, for they were rent in twain. And they were cast down into the earth, but they did smite the earth with the word of God, insomuch that by his power they were delivered out of the depths of the earth, and therefore they could not dig pits sufficient to hold them. And thrice they were cast into the furnace and received no harm. And twice they were cast into a den of beasts, and behold, they did play with the beasts as a child with a suckling lamb, and received no harm. And it came to pass that thus they did go forth among all the people of Nephi, and did preach the gospel of Christ unto all the people upon the face of the land. And they were converted unto the Lord, and were united unto the church of Christ. And thus the people of that generation were blessed according to the word of Jesus. And now I, Mormon, make an end of speaking concerning these things for a time. So what are the advantages of having a translated or a terrestrial body? Well, I just mentioned a few of those things in Third Nephi, but we also learn many things from Latter-day Revelation, primarily given through Joseph Smith. And also, we learn some things through Marvin J. Ballard. Let me go over some of the characteristics of translated beings. They feel no pain, disease, or infirmities. They have power over the elements and aren't bound by the laws of physics as we currently understand them. They can perform all manner of miracles like raising the dead, walking on water, healing the sick, moving mountains, etc. They feel no sorrows except for the sins of the world. Neither Satan nor wicked men have power over them to do any harm. They're immune from fire and other dangers that would consume corruptible beings. They are world-class missionaries, as they possess the convincing power of Christ through their abilities to reason and minister to those under their charge. They have power over laws of gravity. They have power over the elements, as they can control the weather, and all earthly elements will be at their disposal, as these beings come to understand scientific laws and how they work. They can travel and transport themselves at the speed of thought. They have keys to change others into translated beings as well. No prison can hold them. No pit can be dug deep enough to entomb them. They have power to show themselves to whomsoever God desires and to be unseen by those to whom they want to be hidden. They have power over their own death, and thus, when it is time to be resurrected, they can be changed in a twinkling of an eye. They are unharmed by any animal, just as Daniel was transfigured when he was put into the lion's den to escape harm in a more permanent translated state, they too can calm the savage beast. They continue to work towards becoming celestialized beings. During the millennium, all Earth's inhabitants will have the opportunities needed to gain exaltation or any other level of the celestial kingdom that they desire. To sum things up, they're in a pretty nifty state. I don't know about you, but to me, all this sounds pretty impressive. I wonder if I'll be better looking. Religious Blessings
Not long after Christ's final coming, all the obedient will eventually be of one religion whose members recognize that God is the source of all light and truth. We will be the people of Zion. Jesus will be our Messiah. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that truth. This may not happen immediately, but it will happen at one point. Because we'll all be living in the light and understanding the workings of past dispensations, we will recognize the downfalls of Babylon as it exemplifies the great and abominable church as having been based on incorrect principles of men and many times evil practices. This is why those who are living during the millennium will need to be living at least a terrestrial standard. Everyone will see life in the light of truth, recognizing veracity because we'll all abide by gospel principles to achieve all heavenly gifts. This will juxtapose the evil state of the world in which we live now. To me, this is the greatest part of the millennial period. With an eternal perspective, we will be preparing to enter the church of the firstborn as we prepare to live as celestialized individuals in the kingdom of our Father, as joint heirs with Christ, our elder brother. Living during the millennium will be like going to a graduate school in godly studies, whereby by the time we're finished on earth, we might obtain a degree in celestial glory. After the millennium, John foresaw a little more of what was to take place before the end of the Earth's terrestrial existence. He said in Revelation 20, 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Thus we see that after the thousand year period, Satan will again work on an upcoming generation and deceive them with lies. And again, there will be a repeat of an antichrist who will lead a nation to do wickedly. Again, fire will come down from heaven to destroy the wicked, and then the earth will die. Perhaps the Doctrine and Covenants can share another perspective on this as well. In section 88, verse 111 to 115, it says, And then he, Satan, shall be loosed for a little season, that he may gather together his armies. And Michael a.k.a. Adam, the seventh angel, even the archangel, shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of heaven. And the devil shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of hell, and shall come up to battle against Michael and his armies. And then cometh the battle of the great God. And the devil and his armies shall be cast away into their own place that they have not power over the saints any more at all. Michael shall fight their battles and shall overcome him who seeketh the throne of him who sitteth upon the throne, even the Lamb." Unquote. Thus, after the battle of God is concluded, the earth will die and it will be resurrected as well to become the celestial kingdom for all those who had once lived upon this earth and who overcame the world, and who are exalted, or otherwise living in a celestial state. Everyone will have an equal opportunity to accept these blessings. The veil will be removed from our minds, and we will continue to progress throughout the eternities. The millennium is designed to aid mankind 
on a higher plane to further prepare us for two facets of eternal life or God's life. Christ's pivotal role will continue in one, overcoming spiritual death due to the fall so that we might be reconciled to our Heavenly Father again. Remember, the terrestrial state won't allow us to permanently remain in Heavenly Father's presence. We'll still be working on this. And then two, Christ will assist us in overcoming physical death by allowing all mankind to be resurrected in the state of glory that we're willing to live by for eternity. Neither of these things would be at all possible if it were not for Jesus, the Messiah. Yet, finally, the earth will be in a more righteous state, allowing him to take a more visible role in our salvation. The Resurrection We've spoken of the keys of translation that will be restored. According to Joseph Smith, translation is not to be confused with the resurrection. The resurrection will eventually come upon all. And there was a resurrection of many of the righteous at the time that Jesus was resurrected. There will also be a first resurrection at the beginning of the millennium, culminating with the last resurrection occurring at the end of the millennium. This second or last resurrection is to give all of God's children ample time to repent and gain experiences to resurrect into celestialized beings if they so choose. From Alma, we learn a lot about the resurrection. In Alma 40, for example, he said to his son, And behold, again it hath been spoken that there is a first resurrection, a resurrection of all those who have been, or who are, or who shall be, down to the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, we do not suppose that this first resurrection, which is spoken of in this manner, can be the resurrection of the souls and their consignation to happiness or misery. Ye cannot suppose that this is what it meaneth. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, but it meaneth the reuniting of the soul and the body of those from the days of Adam down to the resurrection of Christ. Now, whether the souls and the bodies of those whom has been spoken shall all be reunited at once, the wicked as well as the righteous, I do not say. Let it suffice that I say that they all come forth. Or in other words, their resurrection cometh to pass before the resurrection of those who die after the resurrection of Christ. Now, my son, I do not say that their resurrection cometh at the resurrection of Christ. But behold, I give it as my opinion that the souls and the bodies are reunited of the righteous at the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven. But whether it be at his resurrection or after, I do not say, but this much I say, that there is a space between death and the resurrection of the body, and a state of happiness or in misery until the time which is appointed of God that the dead shall come forth and be reunited, both soul and body, and be brought to stand before God and be judged according to their works. Yea, this bringeth about the restoration of those things which has been spoken of by the mouths of the prophets. The soul shall be restored to the body, and the body to the soul. Yea, every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame. And now, my son, this is the restoration of which has been spoken of by the mouths of the prophets. And then shall the righteous shine forth in the kingdom of God. But behold, an awful death cometh upon the wicked, for they die as to the things pertaining to righteousness, for they are unclean. And no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God but they are cast out and consigned to partake of the fruits of their labors or their works which have been evil and they drink the dregs of a bitter cup." Unquote. It has been revealed that the wicked will have the opportunity to repent until the end of the millennium. But what we don't know for sure 
is what state they'll repent in. We know from the scripture that those who have been wicked will be separated from those who'd righteously kept their second estate of mortality. The wicked, on the other hand, receive an eternal punishment. Now, what is this eternal punishment? In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 19, 10 through 15, we come to learn this context. For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment is God's punishment. Endless punishment is God's punishment. Wherefore, I command you to repent and keep the commandments which you have received by the hand of my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., in my name. And it is by my almighty power that you have received them. Therefore, I command you to repent. Repent, lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth and by my wrath, and by my anger, and your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, yea, how hard to bear ye know not." Unquote. So, therefore, our mortal state is our time to prepare to meet God, and through the second estate, we can continue to progress through Christ's grace until we reach the perfect day. It's important in this realm to prove our obedience. If someone says, well, if I screw up here, I'll have other chances. Well, they're making the road ahead very difficult because the fact is that if we mess up here and never turn our hearts to rely on Christ's infinite atonement to get us back on the right track through repentance, we'll miss out on the first resurrection. And we'll have to suffer even as Christ suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I would add on the cross, I imagine that repenting will be much, much, much more difficult if we're not square with the Lord by the time our earthly time is up. The hell that is spoken about in the scriptures will be the torment of knowing if only I hadn't squandered my opportunities while on the earth, I wouldn't be suffering now. Or if only I had tried to follow a higher law and been true to the pre-earth promises I had made, I could have learned to hear his voice. Those found in this category will know that they really messed up. But through Christ's grace, they will have opportunities to reach a level of glory until the end of the millennium. The amount will still depend on what they decide to do once they face up to their state of wickedness. Christ's plan can still eventually offer some glory, perhaps even a celestial state, but harder lessons to learn. John the Revelator also spoke about this judgment at the end of the earth. He said, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire." Unquote. It sounds like all of us who ever lived are going to be judged by our works. Those written in the book of life will be ready to be resurrected. And those who aren't found therein will be cast into the lake of fire. Perhaps this lake of fire refers to those who will be burned at Christ's coming. And perhaps those whose names are in the book of life are those who received their saving ordinances and stayed true to them. Now, what do we know about the celestial kingdom? This is the next step after the world dies. There is only a little bit that has been fully revealed. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 130, we get a nice glimpse. 
starting in verse 6 it says the angels do not reside on a planet like this earth but they reside in the presence of god on a globe like a sea of glass and fire where all things for their glory are manifest past present and future and are continually before the lord the place where god resides is a great urim and thummim this earth in its sanctified and immortal state will be made like unto a crystal and will be a urim and thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom or all kingdoms of a lower order will be manifest to those who dwell on it and this earth will be christ's then the white stone mentioned in revelation 2 17 will become a urim in thummim to each individual who receives one whereby things pertaining to a higher order of kingdoms will be made known and a white stone is given to each of those who come into the celestial kingdom whereon is a new name written which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it the new name is the key word we learn more of the state of the inhabitants of the celestial kingdom and the requirements to eventually obtain that glory through the vision Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon received in Hiram, Ohio on February 16, 1832. And again, we bear record for we saw and heard, and this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just they are they who received the testimony of jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial being buried in the water in his name and this is according to the commandment which he has given that by keeping the commandments they might be washed and cleansed from their sins and receive the holy spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power and who overcome by faith and are sealed by the holy spirit of promise which the father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true they are they who are the church of the firstborn they are they into whose hands the father has given all things they are they who are priests and kings who have received of his fullness and of his glory and are the priests of the most high after the order of melchizedek which was after the order of enoch which was after the order of the only begotten son wherefore as it is written they are gods even the sons of god wherefore all things are theirs whether life or death or things present or things to come all are theirs and they are christ's and christ is god's and they shall overcome all things wherefore let no man glory in man but rather let him glory in god who shall subdue all enemies under his feet these shall dwell in the presence of god and his christ forever and ever these are they whom he shall bring with him when he shall come in the clouds of heaven to reign on earth over his people these are they who shall have part in the first resurrection these are they who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just these are they who come unto mount zion and unto the city of the living god the heavenly place the holiest of all these are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of enoch and of the firstborn these are they whose names are written in heaven where god and christ are the judge of all these are they who are just men made perfect through jesus the mediator of the new covenant who wrought out its perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood these are they whose bodies are celestial whose glory is that of the sun even the glory of god the highest of all whose glory the sun of the firmament is written of as being typical 
There is so much to gain from studying the topics of the second coming. Through studying these things, God's plan has been made even more clear to me. He wants us all to choose to progress and live with him in the highest kingdom of heaven, which will be on this very earth as it is transformed into a celestial globe. Since the first dispensation of Adam, Christ has set in motion his foreordained plan for us to progress to become more like him. This life is meant so that we can learn for ourselves the difference between good and evil. We learn it well because we temporarily inhabit a body and interact in a society where so much good and evil coexist. God has allowed humans to organically progress and adopt differing religions and economic systems. And over the centuries, several different races have taken on distinct characteristics. Perhaps this is partially meant to help us learn to overcome disparities and discover the importance of loving each other as brothers and sisters and realize that we are more similar than different. Christ's work is hastening and the climax of the plan is almost upon us when the world will be united under him. When Christ comes again, a new age will enter this earth, an age of peace. Although he won't force anyone to follow him, those who choose him will feel joyful in his presence and want to do everything possible to inherit what he is inheriting. Through the millennium, Christ will continue to lift us up from one level of grace to the next as we trust him. Just as the Lord speaks in a still small voice that will pierce the soul, so are the signs leading up to this great event. Why else will they take most of us by surprise? They happen so naturally that if we aren't vigilant, we will miss them for what they are. For me, the best way to understand these occurrences was to create a scriptural puzzle by putting all the scriptures together and look at the same event from different points of reference from each prophet who gave us a piece of the puzzle. I then prayed for understanding. I gained more knowledge than I ever expected. And I invite you to do the same. If you have an open mind, the Spirit can teach you where you are correct and incorrect in your assumptions. The Holy Ghost can confirm to you not only the Lord's timeline, but you can know what part you can personally play and then how you can prepare your family and your ward for this soon eventuality. Remember, this only comes if we ask for guidance and confirmation as we study. I bear witness to you that the day of Christ's return is hastening and that this generation shall not pass before all the prophecies regarding his coming will be completely fulfilled. May we be strengthened and to put our lives in alignment to meet the Savior so that we will be ready to greet him when he returns. If we have heretofore decided to follow the norms of our worldly cultures instead of the gospel, may we quickly turn back to Christ as time is running out. I know that if we follow the prophet's counsel to grow closer to the Savior and to learn to recognize and obey the still small voice that will be protected during Satan's greatest tirade since the earth became inhabited by the children of Adam and Eve. May we pray for charity so that when we meet him, we shall be like him. May we have the faith to expect miracles in our lives due to Christ's grace and goodness so that we might be protected against the judgments being poured out upon the wicked. May we find joy in the knowledge that the Savior is coming soon and may we look forward to this day with gratitude, knowing that the world will soon be changed into a paradisiacal state during the millennium when Christ will reign King of Kings. For if we are prepared, we shall not fear. Let's follow Christ and heed the voices of his living prophets so that we will be protected to abide that day. This is my prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.